You guys ever get down your knees and thank God you're not a pedophile? They didn't choose that. They got dealt a bad hand. We're extremely lucky. We should be grateful. Think about how close we all were. When I was in third grade, I was attracted to third grade girls. Now I like adult women. When I was in third grade, I like grape juice. Now I like red wine, but I still like grape juice. <laughs> Holy hell, that was close. <laughs> Thank God my brain just knew the right way to go. <laughs> Woo! Comedy seems to be one of the only public forums where pedophilia can be openly discussed. It's a perfect format for presenting taboo topics like this because they're able to point out odd realities in our world while also making us laugh at the absurdity of them. What? Pedo! I'm not a pedo, and if I was, you'd be safe, you tubby little ginger cunt. Turning a blind eye and refusing to hear hard truths won't help fix the problem and can make not only the victims of the abuse, but the victims of pedophilic thoughts feel like outcasts that should hide their experiences. For both cases, if nobody else is addressing or acknowledging their trauma, then why should they? And how can victims feel comfortable discussing it when they are the ones that have to start the entire dialogue because it's too taboo for us to ask or even talk about it? There's no worse life available to a human than being a caught child molester. And yet they still do it! Which from, you could only really surmise that it must be really good. I mean, from their point of view, from their, not ours, but from their point of view, it must be amazing for them to risk. Is Louis C.K. wrong here? What other medium besides comedy would it be appropriate to speak this uncomfortable truth? Here's another example of an awkward but perceptive pedophilia joke from the show Dave. Uh, and I said, like, don't change the diaper in front of us because I hate seeing the baby vagina. Because, like, I don't want to look at it and think, like, do I have attraction or not? And I never do, but I hate having that thought process. But what? It's just a comedic way of addressing intrusive thoughts that people have. Acknowledging these disgusting, random thoughts doesn't lend credence to them, but it can let people know that they aren't crazy for having them. Regular people don't have control over intrusive thoughts that pop into their mind, the same way pedophiles don't choose to be sexually attracted to children. Simply saying all pedophiles should be killed does absolutely nothing to prevent further abuse to children. If we close-mindedly demonize anyone who comes forward seeking help with pedophilic thoughts, then of course why would they? They'll be hated for urges that they don't want to have, and in turn will keep all of those dark thoughts to themselves in secret. Then, we'll just have to wait for a child to get abused first, before we can identify the risks. So, by shunning pedophiles, you contribute to their likelihood to offend. Psychologist and sexologist Michael C. Seto has a book about pedophilia where he goes into great detail talking analytically about what exactly pedophilia is and possible interventions. On page 13, he says, quote, Some persons with pedophilia or hebophilia have not committed sexual offenses involving children, and a substantial number of identified sex offenders with child victims would not meet the classification criteria for pedophilia or hebophilia. This sounds incredibly counterintuitive because you could reasonably suspect that all people that molest children would be pedophiles. But if this isn't the case, then it would lead us to believe that molesters have other motivations, like wanting control and power, or having hypersexual interests with low impulsivity management. But of course, there are also those who are just simply attracted to children, not only physically, but emotionally as well. We need open discussion so we can do more research on the topic because we really don't have enough answers. Most people use the term pedophile, molester, and abuser interchangeably, when in reality, as I just mentioned, one doesn't necessarily entail the other. To me, this shows how nuanced and complicated this whole problem is, and being so close-minded and apprehensive to discuss it won't accomplish anything. The term pedophile doesn't even cover all people who are attracted to minors because there are nepiophiles, pedophiles, hebophiles, ephebophiles, and then teleophiles. So that new term that you hear, minor attracted person, or MAP, isn't used to erase the word pedophile, but it's just more specific because it covers the wide range of body and age preferences. These distinctions are important for accurate clinical studies, 
However, for the general public, the most common example talked about is pedophiles, so I'll use that term throughout the essay. One question I've seen people ask when others want to spread awareness of an issue is, how is mere discussion actually going to help or prevent harm? Here's a real-world example of how a lack of acknowledgement and communication on pedophilia caused harm. Gabriel Dance is the deputy investigations editor at the New York Times, where he focuses on the nexus of privacy and safety online. This has led to him reporting on child abuse material that can be found on popular search engines and trying to communicate with these companies and the public about how rampant child sexual abuse is online. In episode 213 of the Making Sense podcast, around 59 minutes in, he talks about how there was a law passed in 2007 that was supposed to help with the identification and reporting of child abuse material online. Unfortunately, the head position overseeing this was never permanently filled, so the problem was never really addressed. He gathers that the only logical reason for this was that people were happy to put the law in place and then turn their backs and not think about the issue any longer, but still feel like they did something good. Dance also has several other articles for the New York Times discussing this topic. In this article, he shows that around the time the law was passed, there were around 100,000 yearly reports of child abuse imagery. In 2018, there were more than 18.4 million. There are many factors as to why this is the case. Maybe way more people are viewing child abuse material, and we're just starting to get better at identifying it. Or maybe there has always been way more out there than we could have imagined. The internet certainly makes it easier for people to exchange pictures and videos of child abuse. They don't have to discreetly exchange Polaroids in a park anymore. They can trade or buy gigabytes worth while sitting at home. Realizing how massive this problem could spread should have been acted upon earlier, but the lack of discussion and awareness let it thrive in the shadows. Now, before we really get into it, I should plainly state my views on pedophilia so nothing is misinterpreted. I think acting on pedophilic urges is morally wrong. I don't think it should be legalized and I think it should be punished. Enacting these urges is wrong because it emotionally and physically harms children and it violates consent that they cannot ethically give. I can also imagine that there will be some who say that the only type of person who would talk about pedophilia in a non-condemning way is a pedophile themselves. This is an unfalsifiable accusation that sidelines any discussion. You can throw around claims like that in any debate, and now you've given yourself an out to write off anything that that person says and stay ignorant to differing ways of thought. My goals here are to spark thought on this problem, ponder on the torment that these thoughts have on pedophiles, and demonstrate how hostile reactions won't help solve it. I also reached out to the Virtuous Pedophiles website, and I asked them a handful of various questions about their experiences. These are people who have pedophilia that don't act on it, and have a community where they help people deal with these urges. I think the most interesting way to use their answers is by interspersing them throughout the essay when relevant topics come up. They don't speak for the organization as a whole, and I have no agenda in how I'm using their quotes, but I think they give an authentic insight. I got plenty of differing answers to the questions I asked, so I only used a handful of replies, and they aren't representative of all pedophiles' experiences. Yes, I'm aware that they could be lying, but given how blunt and honest their answers are, I have no reason to suspect this. I touched them. What do you mean exactly touched? I fondled them. What for? I couldn't help myself. Dr. Bill Maplewood is a therapist, a family man, and a pedophile. For the first part of this film, we see him channel his urges by masturbating to teen boy magazines. He also goes to a therapist, where he describes his fantasies about committing mass shootings. He feels comfortable telling this to his therapist, yet he's still unable to verbalize his pedophilic urges. Bill is around his 40s, so we can assume that he's struggled with these feelings for over 25 years. Imagine having sexual proclivities that you can't legally act on and have to suppress for the majority of your life. This would mean that you can never have sex with who you truly want, and you can't even legally watch porn that would appeal to you. I doubt most people could do this for any meaningful amount of time. Think about their suffering. Sexuality 
is the strongest force in human beings. To be born with a forbidden sexuality must be agonizing. The pedophile who manages to get through life with the shame of his desire while never acting on it deserves a bloody medal. Not only are pedophiles sexual proclivity towards children, but there's an emotional component as well. They fall in love with children the same way we fall in love with adults. There's infatuation, admiration, and romance. So they have to also resist fully immersing themselves in that mindset as well. I fell in love with a four-year-old when I was 11. It's happened two or three times since then. And those girls really capture my heart and catch my eye. So I think they're probably not random intrusive thoughts. I like everything about them and I'd crawl over hot coals for any of them. Going back to the film Happiness, without any support system or help whatsoever, Bill eventually takes advantage of a situation that presents itself. He drugs his family and then rapes his son's friend when he has a sleepover. Now of course, I'm not condoning or excusing this behavior in any way. What he did was sickening. But for someone in his situation, it makes sense that he would want to act upon the best chance he'll likely ever get. These urges grow gradually over time, and you can see Bill morally struggle with what he's done. It's also interesting to see that he has the strength to not molest his own child, even though he has the urge to. Will you ever fuck me? No. I jerk off instead. Like many pedophiles, Bill had no outlet or help to discuss his sexual desires. In isolation, he's still able to fight those urges for decades. Is it unreasonable to think that it could have stayed that way with some help? In the beginning, it was hard, very hard. Not that I didn't have control, but I was very self-conscious. The worst thing about being a pedophile is that you're always worried about other people finding it and then destroying your life. The guilty and the bad thoughts, that I was a time bomb destined to offend eventually, and that it was something that I would struggle with my whole life. Eventually, I learned that I was wrong. Even with these thoughts, I was not a bad person. Looking at boys in the street and finding them beautiful, it was not a bad thing. I am allowed to live a normal life. I tend to not like watching or seeing pedophiles depicted negatively. Doing so makes me feel bad about myself, i.e. inclined to see myself as perceived by a disgusted, ill-informed non-pedophile. A bad person. Something less than human. I'm trying to put that feeling behind me. When discussing the film, Roger Ebert said, quote, Does happiness exploit its controversial subjects? Finally, no. It sees them as a symptom of desperation and sadness. It is more exploitative to create a child molester as a convenient villain, as many movies do, by disregarding his humanity and seeing him as an object. Such movies do the same thing that a molester does. The haunting fact is that child molesters are human. That's how they're able to blend in with the rest of us. I think some people need to classify them as subhuman to cope with the brutality that they have caused. In the same vein, I also see people irrationally say that they want rapists to be raped in prison. If you think this, then you aren't against the act of rape itself, just who it happens to. What about the person that would be doing it? Are they now morally justified in doing the vile and disgusting thing you supposedly hate just because it's to someone you think deserves it rather than an innocent? This is just perpetuating a scenario where someone is doing an evil and depraved act to someone. So I don't think condoning that is an ethical stance to have. Most of these people know that they have feelings that they should repress. So most of these people don't act out on it. They don't offend, which is great, isn't it? But the problem is these people can't talk about their feelings because they know that they will be hated for it. Just because you have pedophilic thoughts doesn't mean you're destined to be an offender. Why should we condemn non-offending pedophiles if they haven't done anything wrong? A common reply is, well, they just haven't done anything wrong yet. We should kill them before they get the chance. 
Is this really enough justification to kill someone? It's well known that children growing up in single parent households are more likely to become criminals. Should we prematurely punish them as well? Quote, children living without either parent, foster children, are 10 times more likely to be sexually abused. And children who live with a single parent that has a live-in partner are 20 times more likely than children living with both biological parents. Should we criminalize single parents for adding this increased risk to their children? Yes, the danger here is still abuse towards children. But as we established earlier, not everyone who molests children are pedophiles. So even if all pedophiles were killed, kids would still be abused. There are many other crimes that we can statistically predict, but we leave room for human rights, personal autonomy, wrongful accusations, and legal processing. Is sexual abuse even the biggest problem that children face? In 2020, 618,000 cases of child abuse were recorded. Now, throughout this essay, I've been using the term abuse synonymously with sexual molestation, but in this instance, under 10% of those cases actually came from sexual abuse, and 76% of cases came from neglect. While almost 62,000 cases of sexual abuse shouldn't be written off and should be punished of course, this shows that molestation isn't the biggest threat to kids. So if we advocate killing anyone at a risk of harming kids, then we have to drastically increase our scope of candidates, and in doing so, limit everybody's human rights. Any additional surveillance or regulation would have to apply to everybody, because we wouldn't know who is or isn't at risk. Unfortunately, we have no way to know who will really commit crimes based on their circumstances, upbringing, and mental predispositions. This is why prevention is so important. And in order for that to happen, pedophiles have to be able to come forward and seek help. As of now, we mainly just have punishment and some rare forms of therapy that hopefully deter and prevent the behavior from happening in the future. But we clearly can help most with prevention. This concept of crime prevention reminds me of a concept called pre-crimes. This was coined by author Philip K. Dick and can be seen in films like The Minority Report. This is where crimes are identified before they happen. This leads to law enforcement preventing these crimes by arresting people before the predicted crime becomes an actuality. They are then detained in a comatose state for an unspecified duration of time. In the real world where we don't have people or machines that can perfectly predict our ethical behavior, trying to adhere to these preconceptions of people is of course impossible. And I think radical attempts to accomplish this would ultimately violate individual autonomy, consent, and human rights, akin to the thought crimes people are punished for in the novel 1984. So we've established that acting on urges of pedophilia is immoral. But this brings up a very uncomfortable question of asking, are mere thoughts themselves about sexually abusing children morally wrong in and of itself? A lot of people will have fast and blunt answers to that question, like saying, of course it is, and it's a stupid question to even ask in the first place. But let's really examine this idea. Another reply could be, one, the thoughts have potential for harm. But we've already established that punishment for predicted crimes that have yet to happen can be immoral. And many victims of these thoughts recognize that they are wrong and don't want to act on them. Or two, it speaks to that person's character that they would even have thoughts like that. Okay, but if the thoughts are involuntary, then it would actually be immoral to punish them for an unchosen sexual proclivity. Doesn't this discussion we're having right now put those thoughts into your head to some degree? When you read about an instance of child sexual abuse, you can't stop your mind from filling in those images. So by this logic, then you should also now be morally condemned by proxy. Sure, you don't have the same attraction as a pedophile, but the thought is nevertheless now in your mind. Or three, well, it's just gross thoughts to have and they shouldn't be having them. Of course, this is understandable and the actions depicted in the thoughts are wrong and sickening, but they are just thoughts, not actions. Disgust doesn't equate immorality. There are plenty of choices that people make that are perfectly ethical and legal that some would find disgusting. A heterosexual man would think that having sex with a large, obese, hairy guy would be gross, but it's not immoral for someone else to do it. Others find that to be the most appealing sexual partner that they could think of. 
So I think there are justifications in morally condemning actions that pedophilic thoughts entail, but not the thoughts themselves, just because they're gross. Here are a couple quotes from the Verped members that I got when I asked about their marriage status and internal thoughts they have during sex. You may find them vulgar, but like I've said, I find it difficult to fully morally condemn mere mental images. I am married and I find my wife attractive. However, the closer she has looked to the prepubescent ideal, the more I've liked it, i.e. shaving. I have fantasized about sex with a child while having sex with her, but I often try to keep those thoughts out of my head. I have some emotional attraction to women, so I've gone on a handful of dates. I had a short-term girlfriend once, but we were never intimate, and I wasn't sexually attracted to her. My age of attraction includes some teenagers, so I tried hooking up with young adult men who look like children, twinks if you will. However, it barely satisfied the sexual needs I had for a relationship. I was always longing for something that I couldn't have, and that made me depressed. If I ever got married, it would be to a woman, because I've always wanted to be a father. I am confident that I would be thinking about children whenever we had sex, and that just wouldn't be fair to her. Speaking even more about the thought process of people with pedophilia, how do you imagine they go about their day? How would you say you manage to control um, your sexual urges? A lot of people think that if you're attracted to kids that you, you have some kind of like unusual degree of urge to go out and you know attack kids and it's not like that. Most people, you know, when they see somebody that they're attracted to, do they automatically think, oh, I want to jump on them and have sex with them? So it's the same with us. It's just, you know, we just happen to be attracted to kids. This seems fairly logical to me. Speaking as a heterosexual guy, how many of us see hot women in movies and think the most wild and crude sexual acts that we would do to them if we could? I would fuck that girl if she was my sister. I would let that girl give me fucking AIDS. And I'm gonna fuck you so bad, you're gonna be coming out of your ears. People simp over Margot Robbie feet shots and muscle mommy Instagram fitness influencers. Yeah, sometimes we're also just joking around, but there is a level of honest desperation and lust. But obviously, when we see someone attractive in public, we don't plot how we're going to stalk, drug, and then rape them. We just notice they're attractive and then move on with our day. Since I'm attracted to women and could physically overpower some if I wanted to, does that mean that I'm destined to be a rapist just because I have an attraction to women, many of whom it's not possible for me to have sex with? Enacting dark fantasies is a human dilemma that is not exclusive to pedophiles. Pedophiles fundamentally aren't as drastically different from others as we might think. If it's possible for pedophilic thoughts to arise in one person, then it's entirely possible that they could happen in another. Yes, even in you. In this chapter, I've argued that we can't ethically punish people for pre-crimes and that pedophiles shouldn't be demonized for thoughts that they haven't acted on and didn't choose to have. So, what should we do with them then? I fucked them. Would, would you do it again? Yes. It's hard to find accurate, reliable data on what percent of people with pedophilia actually offend and what percentage don't. Without many outlets of prevention and treatment methods, we mainly just have data on recidivism rates for those who have offended. Going back to Michael C. Seto's book on pedophilia, he shares some statistics about this on page 166. Quote, one study may report a sexual recidivism rate of 7%, whereas another study reports a sexual recidivism rate of 47%. But this is not very informative until we also know that the first study followed sex offenders of two years, whereas the second study followed them for 20 years. To me, this shows that apprehension and rehabilitation of offending pedophiles seems extremely helpful in the short term. Where else can we find a recidivism rate as low as 7%? Compare that recidivism with this 10-year study that followed a random sample of 73,600 prisoners, those of which were convicted for things like homicide, rape, or sexual assault. The study doesn't specify which percentage of each. 43% were arrested again within the first year released, and 66% by the end of the third year. While these are only two studies and maybe some offenders were able to hide their crimes, 
I think they challenge our preconceived notions about reoffending. I am also curious about how much public condemnation of offending pedophiles plays a part in stopping their recidivism. So if there were more support systems for pedophiles, there's reason to believe that the recidivism rate could drop even further, and even more likely that it would prevent some from offending in the first place. However, as far as we can tell, there's no effective treatment to completely remove pedophilic urges, aside from the rare cases where a brain tumor is involved. So, how do we address this then? Is it reasonable to expect pedophiles to have zero outlets for their sexuality for their entire lives? If they don't want to cause harm by creating or viewing child abuse imagery, then what other methods would be appropriate? There's things that might work and we don't even try them. Like, is anybody working on very realistic child sex dolls? Okay, then let them fuck your kids forever, is that, if that's better. I'm so sorry for suggesting something that might actually work. Oh, no. Let them fuck both my sons, but don't make a doll. That would be distasteful. The biggest worry with this is that it would encourage pedophilic behavior or that people without pedophilia might also try the dolls and make the practice too common. I'd like to see research done on this topic before I can fully agree with it being put into practice, but I think uncomfortable approaches like this need to be explored. Yes, it's gross to think about and imagine if you don't share the sexuality, but if that would allow them to funnel their urges into an outlet that doesn't harm anyone, then why be against it? Here's some responses I got from the Verped forum when I asked about their thoughts on the topic. I think it would be okay for most people. While I would like to have one, it's probably better for me to not have one. As an addict, it would be like an alcoholic drinking virgin margaritas all the time. It would keep that taste on your mind. From what I've heard from talking to people who have them, they don't cause people to make an extra leap. From what it seems, it sounds like something that people have made up out of fear because they don't understand it, as it's just a bunch of material. I don't see how having or using one should be a problem. I have a doll. She's a toddler in realistic size. She is a regular doll, not a sex doll, but I have sex with her. I am a woman, so I don't need any holes or anything like that. Any doll works fine for me. But since my attraction is mostly nurturing and emotional, sex is actually quite rare for me, like maybe every second week or something. But I hug and cuddle with her a lot, every day, and I care for her a lot, like she is my own child. She is absolutely satisfying for me, and is my safe outlet, but mostly, she is my emotional comfort in life. Later in the reply, when I asked about their sexual attraction and difficulties coping with it, she responded with, I am exclusively a pedophile, so I don't have any attraction to adults. Actually, I have never felt any romantic or sexual attraction to a person above 13 years old, but my attractions for little girls is strong, even little girls as young as toddlers. I just want to hug and cuddle with them, play with them, care for them, spend all of my time with them, hold hands, kiss, but also be sexual with them. But I know that that last thing can never happen only with my doll. Throughout this essay, I have yet to mention the extreme cases of child abuse and torture that seem to be the only time we think about the issue. There is a much darker and sadistic reality that exists. I have to address this so it doesn't seem like I'm sugarcoating the problem. They're extremely disturbing, but we need to know the realities. In one of Gabriel Dance's articles for the New York Times, he cites a recent abuse case that happened with more than a dozen men over Zoom. Quote, A man was sexually assaulting a six-year-old boy. One of the viewers asked the assailant to spread the boy's buttocks, another to spit in his face, and a third to rape him. The boy was orally raped and violently penetrated, while some of the men, appearing on cameras of their own, cheered and masturbated for the others to see. The men also broadcast pre-recorded clips of young children, including infants, being raped, beaten, and urinated on. During the trial, an investigator said that the offenders often knew that live streams are harder to detect and leave no record. That's why they go to Zoom, said the federal prosecutor in the case, Austin Berry, during his closing remarks. It's the Netflix of child pornography. In another article by Dance, there was a case where, 
Quote, Another showed a woman inserting an ice cube into the vagina of a young girl before tying her ankles together, taping her mouth shut, and suspending her upside down. As the video continued, the girl was beaten, slapped, and burned with a match or candle. This is the type of behavior the open discussion needs to prevent. However, a number of these offenders here could be considered socio or psychopaths that are taking out their aggression and desires in a way that just happens to be pedophilic. But for pedophiles, this certainly isn't the starting out point and is not what many of them want to do. From the answers I received from the Virtuous Pedophile website, a big insight I gleaned from them was just how much they love children in a romantic way. For a lot of them, the essence of a child is what they're attracted to. The creepy rapist mindset that we assume all pedophiles have isn't always accurate. So while it's still true that if they acted on their thoughts, it would be wrong, even they would be appalled by this extreme, torturous behavior. Do I wish to have sex with a kid? Yes, I have the urge, but I know that it would be prejudicial and would cause harm. I prefer to die than be the cause of harm that kind of harm. I would never be able to act on it, to offend. I love boys too much for that. I'm human, I make mistakes, and I think I deserve to be treated with empathy. It's not easy living a life where you're afraid to lose everything if your urges are exposed, where you see yourself as a monster, not worthy of a life of happiness. I wouldn't want to see something depicting sexual abuse because that's the stigmatized view of pedophiles, that pedophiles sexually abuse children. We don't. We love children. I feel really bad if I see a movie where a little girl is being harmed in any way at all. It hurts me a lot. Wanting to treat people before they do the horrifying behavior I described, pedophiles or not, should be fairly obvious. Like I said before, if we don't let people come forward and get help with their pedophilic thoughts or extreme urges when they first start to have them, then we have to wait for a tragedy to happen first before we can identify the risks. In every single interview I've ever seen that has someone describing when they first started realizing they were attracted to kids, they all say that they noticed it in their teenage years. When we think of pedophiles, we tend to not imagine people who are still kids, but this is the best time for them to get help with their attractions. So for anyone listening who might have feelings of minor attraction that they're struggling with, these websites are some good resources for support and prevention help. These two podcasts, Listening is Understanding and The Prevention Podcast, provide excellent discussions on various aspects of pedophilia and MAPS. For any parents listening who are horrified at the rampant child sexual abuse that is available online, Dr. Deborah So, who is an author and a former academic sex researcher, has books and a podcast where she often talks about tips for recognizing the grooming of children and steps to preventing it. This is a monumental problem that has no signs of disappearing. So we really have to be open to discussing different research and treatment methods so we can help prevent as much suffering as possible to those who get preyed on and even in those who have the unchosen attraction. I don't think I've ever encountered any media that didn't depict us as predators. As you may be able to imagine, this is the worst thing you can communicate to a person with minor attraction. It isolates us. It makes us afraid of ourselves and afraid to talk about what we're experiencing. It causes us to believe that we're doomed to offend. A map who is isolated and afraid and depressed is at a much bigger risk of self-harm as well as a risk to their communities. If maps can hear the message that they can live fulfilling, happy, non-offending lives, their risk drops dramatically. Thanks for watching until the end. If you want to support the channel even further, consider joining my Patreon. You can participate in monthly Q&As and get insight into what I'm working on next. And a huge thanks to those of you who are already over there. Thanks for watching my videos.